crushed on for years. And then I went to visit this couple, and they were going through a certain kind of upheaval. And late one night, nothing ever happened, but I felt for the first time after the husband had gone to bed, there was a moment that I, you know, have commemorated in some awful poem and thought about for years where I realized that this person who I had psychically been chasing around for so long and coveting was actually, because of turmoil within her marriage, ready to have physical sexual contact with me, or at least it seemed very clear, and I got very frightened and kind of freaked out by it. My bluff was called, and I backed away from the situation. But it has been rattling around inside for you know, it still is, because it was a real moment of realizing that I was transgressing. And and unlike many third points, I knew both and loved and still love both of those people. Is that why you backed away because of your, your allegiance to the husband? I think unconsciously what I wanted was to get married and be in a happy marriage. And the moment I saw that this happy marriage was like most marriages, not so happy, I felt very frightened and disillusioned. Yeah. What about you? I've never been in a full-blown affair where I was that other woman, that third point, but I approached it. I had met this really charismatic man who was maybe five or seven years older than me. When I was 19, he was in a poetry class Uh that I took as an undergraduate. His wife at the time when I first met him was just, you know, having the baby, and I just had a crush on him. Right. And... Years passed, maybe five years passed, and I was in the midst of getting divorced from my first husband. Mm. And I went to this bar, and I looked up on stage, and there is this man from Mm. my poetry class who's the lead singer in this band. And afterwards, he came off the stage. He recognized me, and we had this lovely little reunion. And I told him, you know, where I was working. I was a waitress at this place called Nikki's Cafe. And the next day, I was on my shift, And he walks in, and he sits at the bar, Mm. and he looks at me. And it was absolutely electric. And he said, what time do you get off work? And I told him. And we went and had a drink. And across the table, when we were at this place having a drink, he said, have an affair with me. (gasps) And I mean, that's really sexually exciting. It's really erotic, right? Yeah. And so within minutes, we were, of course... You know, scrambling out of the bar into his car, making out, and you know, we drive back to my apartment, and I'm free and clear. I'm getting divorced. I'm not at this point the cheater, but he's not free and clear. He's got a wife. He's got kids. There's a family back there. Yeah. And it was hot. It was flaming, scorching hot. And I said <laughs> to him, "We have to stop, and you have to go home." Why did you say that? What happened? Because. I realized that I was about to make a decision to walk into a burning building. Mm. That was the image that came into my mind. This house is on fire, and I had the choice whether to walk into it or turn away from it and run. And, And in my life, at this era of my life, what I had been doing over and over again is choosing to walk into the burning building. And, you know, so I didn't. I turned away, went away, life went on, years passed. Wild came out. I was on my book tour a couple years ago. (laughs) And I walk into the bookstore, and there is this man. And he turns to me, and he says, Cheryl Strayed. And I say his name back to him. And we immediately just look at each other and laugh and smile. And he hugs me, and he says to me, I'm divorced. And I say to him, I'm married. That's the last time I saw him. The end. Curtain (laughs) drop. Drop the mic. We don't even have to do an episode. But you know what, Cheryl? We're somehow going to have to do an episode. And it is an episode, as you might have guessed by now, that is about being that third point on the triangle, being the other person, the other woman, specifically in the letters we'll talk about. And it arises from actually our three-part series on infidelity, the betrayer, the betrayed, and then our wonderful discussion with Esther Perel. And we received in the wake of those episodes, what I want to say was, you know, dozens of letters from uh, men and mostly women saying, wait a second, you've left part of this out. You've left the third point in the triangle out. 
One of the sentiments that was so fascinating is that most of these letter writers knew that they were sort of um, authoring their own demise. They knew that they were the reason for their own pain, but they also had a very strong, powerful feeling that they weren't the other woman. As we'll see from these letters, it's very powerful that when you're in a relationship with somebody who's really paying attention and you can't do anything but think about each other all the time, of course you feel like you're not the other woman. You're the woman. The wife is the other woman. Right. And she's the one who he's with for all these other reasons that aren't about passion and love. You know, there's convention, there's, well, they have kids or they have financial obligations to each other. But he chose me and he chose me even though it's illicit and morally questionable or many would say wrong. And I think a lot of these letters that we saw, and we did, we got dozens of them, there would be this kind of manic, like, I know it's wrong. It makes me feel terrible and I feel neglected and, you know, he spends holidays with his wife, and I'm alone a lot. And on the other hand, there was this, but this is right. We were meant to be. We're soulmates. He loves his wife, but he's not in love with her. There was a lot of that kind of sentiment that ran through most of these letters. That's right. It's wrong in the eyes of law and moral convention, but it's right in my heart. It's a kind of outlaw version of love. It somehow feels more authentic because it cuts against the conventional expectations that aren't really where most people live. Indeed. So later in the episode, we're going to talk to Susan Cheever, who has written about her own experience as the other woman in one of her many books, Desire, Where Sex Meets Addiction. Mm. And, you know, she's had the experience before. So we're going to ask her for some insight. She's been there. And we're going to look at this issue of being the other woman from a couple of vantage points. Yeah. One is a kind of classic, I'm in love with him and he's married and, and will he ever leave his wife? The other, a little different. But for now, why don't we get to the letter, Steve? Absolutely. Here it is. Dear Sugars, I'm in love with my best friend, and he's married. And I'm desperately trying to figure out if I should wait for him. Some context. He's an artist. I'm a writer. We've known each other for years, and for most of that time, we were both married. My marriage produced two amazing kids and a comfortable companionship for many years, but little in the way of passion. Then the companionship faded. In the last two years of our marriage, we slept in separate rooms. It was during this time that my best friend and I started having an affair. The affair started as coffee and lunch dates and Facebook messages every night. Sometimes the back and forth would last an hour or two. After we acknowledged our physical attraction and the affair began in earnest, things escalated quickly. We went from being best friends who talked all day long to sex maniacs finding any way and any place to have sex We've explored every kink we'd ever even entertained and some we'd never even considered and are amazed and awestruck at how sexually compatible we are. We're closing in on two years of being together and the desire has only grown stronger. Not only that, but we still talk all day long, we relate on a creative and artistic level and we never tire of each other's company. In fact, we're desperate for more. We're in love, madly in love. There's no doubt about that. At first, we both had immense guilt about what we were doing. Over time, we both came to think that we simply chose the wrong spouses. We wish we'd met each other 20 years ago. We know that our affair is wrong, but at the same time, we truly believe that this is meant to be. The trouble is, I'm now single, and he's not. I went to therapy and figured out that the best solution for my marriage was to end it. Luckily, my husband independently reached that same conclusion, and we've separated very amicably. There have been a few bumps, but mostly it's the best-case scenario. We're both feeling happier, we co-parent as friends, and our kids are reflecting that back to us and their happy dispositions. My best friend is still married, and much to my dismay and despair, he still has sex with his wife. He claims it's maintenance sex, which he's keeping up for the time being so as not to raise any red flags. He left his job to start a new business and hasn't quite taken off yet, and he says he doesn't want to leave his wife in a lurch. He feels like he needs to stay in this marriage for a little while longer to become financially solvent for his wife's benefit and for their kids, and also so he's not relying on me for financial support. He says this maintenance sex is the bare minimum, that he doesn't enjoy it, that she barely tries, it takes five minutes. He says he avoids it as much as he can, that it freaks him out, that it's not the same as what we have by a long shot. He says I should take solace in that. Try as I might, I can't. 
He says he wants to be with me to marry me. He says he's trying to move things in the direction of leaving his marriage. We've talked very pragmatically about our kids all being siblings. We're both on board. He's seeing a therapist for the first time, trying to figure out how to make this transition. He says he's never felt about anyone the way he feels about me, and I believe that. For my part, I've never felt more turned on, cared for, or more loved, except when I don't, except when I know that they're having sex or think they're having sex, or even when I know they're having a nothing special family day together. It kills me. And then I feel terrible, like I don't matter to him, and I question everything. It absolutely guts me. This feeling affects me at least once a week, and it's always exactly the same. He acknowledges my pain and says he'd feel the same way if things were reversed. He says that we're worth the wait. But if I'm suffering, even 10 or 20 percent of the time, is it? If I knew he was going to leave her, if I had some assurance, if I had an idea of when it might happen, maybe I could feel better about those moments. But while he said that he wants to spend the rest of his life with me, nothing has been guaranteed. I'm trying to be grateful for the present, for the things we have which feel so rare and valuable, but these weekly bouts of jealousy and doubt have me feeling stymied. How do I plan a future if I don't know the person I love more than anything is going to be in it? Do I leave? Do I stay? And if I stay, how do I stay sane until we can be together out in the open? And if I leave, how do I get over the love of my life? Outside of my therapist, I have literally no one else to talk about this, and I'm desperate for an outside perspective. Please help, Sugars. Sincerely, helplessly hoping. Wow. Mm. Helplessly hoping. My heart goes out to you. What a tortured situation. I mean... I think you're in the burning building. Yeah. You know, when I burning building. told that story and said, you know, I could see that that house was burning and I decided not to walk into it. It right. was for some of these same reasons mm-hmm. that as exciting as that first sexual passion can be, there's a price to pay for that when you do find yourself, you know, actually falling in love with somebody who's in love with somebody else and obligated to somebody else. And what you're feeling, this jealousy of your lover having sex with someone else is really natural and normal. And it's also really natural and normal that your lover would be having sex with his wife. Yeah. You know, that's the deal when you are the other woman, you know, involved with a married man. And we don't know if he's going to stay or leave. We know some men leave their wives and marry the other woman and some drag it on for years and never leave. So who we're going to speak to over this discussion is you. What might be in your best interest? What's going to protect your heart and your mind and your emotional health? Yeah. You know, there's really two issues here, and and we'll deal, I think, much more prominently with the second issue in the second letter, which does have to do with what are my moral duties here, Mm -hmm. not to love, but to the role I'm playing here, which is that I am involved with a married man and and party to, she hopes, the breakup of a marriage with kids, Mm -hmm. okay? We're going to put that aside because I think we'll grapple with that with some help a little bit later on. The, The central question here is, do I really trust that this guy is going to leave his wife? And right at the center of your you know, wrenching letter is the sentence, if I knew he was going to leave her, if I had some assurance. You don't. And people, when they are under the spell of love, say all kinds of things, like this is the most profound thing, and our children are all going to be together, and I promise I'm going to leave. And I'm not saying that the man that you're in love with is lying to you. He may not be. He may fully intend to. But what your inner turmoil is telling you is that you need the matter settled and you need him to give you an honest accounting. Mm -hmm. And until he does that, you are going to have 80 percent ecstatic bliss and soul connection and 20 percent abject fear and despair and uncertainty. And, you know, one thing I want to first say is we get letters from couples who both left their spouses so that they could be together. Yeah. You know, they fell in love. And they did the, the responsible thing, and they ended those relationships so they could have a relationship with each other. Right. Now, helplessly hoping, that's what you did. You fell in love with somebody else, and you realized your marriage was over, okay? Your partner has not done that. So let's look at what he has said about that. 
He's saying he's staying for financial reasons. He left his job to start a new business, and it hasn't taken off yet. He says he doesn't want to leave his wife in a lurch. Does that logic make sense to you, Steve? It certainly could. His own logic is, if I get this business off the ground and I'm sure that I can support my wife and family and pay alimony and child support, that will put me in a better position to commit the great act of betrayal and suffer the, you know, the logical and necessary guilt of being the person who withdraws from the marriage. I can understand that, but I think it's a more fundamental question. The marriage that you were in, Helplessly Hoping, had, I guess, the best possible outcome in the sense that your infidelity, as Esther Perel would say, the meaning of it was that you weren't happy in your marriage. And guess what? Your husband wasn't happy either, and so you were able to amicably part. That's pretty much the ideal situation in a pretty rotten setup where, you know, two people who loved each other fall apart and there are kids that they have to co-parent. You really negotiated that incredibly well. I'm not going to say that having an affair was the best way to discover that because it involves deceit, but what you discovered was deeply meaningful and you both were in the same place and you're able to be good parents together. That's terrific. Your lover is not in that situation. And the question that you need to ask him or force him to ask himself and give you an honest accounting of is, what is the meaning of this affair to you? Because we are engaged in an affair and you're legally married to somebody else. What is the meaning of it? Mm -hmm. Is it the thing that it was in your relationship where it told you you wanted to be out of this marriage and needed to be out of this marriage and find a better love? Maybe, but it's not as unambivalent and unambiguous as it was in your case. Mm -hmm. One of the things to ponder, I mean, I think most affairs begin from a place of dysfunction, right? I mean, even if you're cheating on your spouse who you're no longer in love with, let's just assume and hope that you have some respect and regard for them, some love for them, and and you feel bad about the fact that you're deceiving them. So for the course of the illicit part of this affair, it is dysfunctional and often deeper. It's It, it, it runs against your moral code. Okay. And helplessly hoping you extracted yourself from that, right? You know, you got clear with yourself. You made it right with your ex-husband. You aren't cheating on him anymore. And so when you think about the trajectory you're hoping to go in with your lover, it is moving from that dysfunctional beginning into a, a functional relationship that will be free of things like deceit and infidelity and so forth. And so I'm sure that it doesn't reassure you to hear that essentially your lover isn't willing to leave his wife until he's financially solvent at some sort of amorphous date in the future that may or may not come. Right. You know, And I just want a little side note here. I, I am a little concerned about some of this language that you use to describe. You say he feels like he needs to stay in this marriage for a while longer to become financially solvent for his wife and kids' benefit. And I also just want to add perhaps for his own too, yeah. that you know maybe he's not ready to leave his wife because he's in part financially dependent on her, okay? Right. You know, we're on incredibly shaky ground here in terms of his reasoning for staying, which tells me that there must be something more going on. We, you know, one of the weirdest parts, I'm going to guess, about being the other woman is you don't actually know. Here you are intimate with one member of that marriage, but not with both. You get to hear about the marriage, this maintenance sex and how he's not in love with her, but you don't really know what's happening in that home when they have those nothing special family days, or they have those thinking about other things, um, barely doing it kind of sex. Right. You're both intimate and utterly excluded. This is part of the agony of this. And so, you know, my advice to you when it comes to sort of taking apart what's the holdup here? Why is it that you could leave your husband and your lover can't leave his wife? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, how serious is he about making this transition? Right. How does he respond to your request that you actually make some plans together? You might have a lot to worry about. That anxiety you feel about maybe he never will leave might be an anxiety that, that speaks to the truth of the situation. Right. We can say from our own you know, letters and our own experience, there are cases where a part of the turn on is that it is an affair. Yeah. And that part of the problem is that some people, when there's too much security or there's a marriage, suddenly the passion dies out. And it is within the realm of possibility or something you might be thinking about and maybe even discussing with this man is whether it's something about marriage itself that deadens him, deadens his passion, because he, you don't want to wind up four or five years down the road being the person with whom he is having maintenance sex. 
and n realizing that either you or he or maybe both of you need to go outside the boundaries of a marriage in order to find the kind of charge and connection that you've found with each other. I'm not saying that's necessarily going to happen, but oftentimes that's the dynamic. And the other man or the other woman, the person outside of that marriage, doesn't realize that part of the charge is that they're forbidden. Mm -hmm. And when they're suddenly the designated mate, the uh, morally approved safe mate, a lot of the charge and connection and, frankly, intimacy uh, dies off. It yeah. doesn't always happen, but it, it is something that we hear about again and again. Well, I mean, I think there's no question about that, right? I mean, the, the part of the reason that people in long-term relationships often find love and sex and affairs outside of those relationships is not because they fell out of love. It's just because it's really hard to maintain that kind of erotic allure mm -hmm. that you, you have in an affair. You know, I... In closing, you know, my, my final thought for you, Helplessly Hoping, is, you know, I just want you to know that just because you don't have a sort of official public legal standing with this man, I mean, you can't even really be his girlfriend in any sort of open way. And I think that that must deplete your sense of having a right to make demands on this lover, right? You feel like, well, he's married to somebody else. He says he loves me, but he doesn't have any commitment or obligation to me. But he does. And so I would really strongly encourage you to put an end date on your suffering. Right. Now, if it doesn't work out and your heart's broken, you know, who knows how long it will take to heal that heart. But I do know for certain that you get to be in charge of how long that you're willing to agonize in this state of unknowing. Is he going to leave his wife? Is he going to come to me? So think about is it really important to you that he's financially solvent before he leaves that relationship? Or is it more important to you that he commits to you? There are all kinds of solutions that you guys can come up with together, but you can only do it if you actually address it head on and make a plan. You really do deserve to move forward in your life with this relationship or without it. I wish you luck. Mm, amen. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR and the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene Now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. I'm Michelle Goldberg. I'm Ross Douthat. And I'm David Leonhardt. We're the hosts of The Argument, a new podcast from the New York Times opinion section. These days, it's more important than ever to listen to people who disagree with you. Maybe they'll teach you something new. Or maybe they'll just teach you how to beat them. So listen to The Argument from The New York Times. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. Whew. Whew. Well, listen, we got to move on to a new letter and a new sort of part of this terrain of the other woman. And we're going to get some help from the wonderful novelist and memoirist and biographer Susan Cheever, so let's give her a call. Hello? Susan? Yes? Hi, this is Cheryl Strayed. How are you? Hi, Cheryl. How are you? I'm such a huge fan of yours. Oh, thank you. Well, the feeling is mutual. I'm so delighted that you agreed to be on the show today. I'm here with Steve Almond. Hi. Hi, Steve. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your story and your experiences in this kind of being one of the points of what is often a triangle, the other woman? Well, yes, I was the other woman in two marriages that ended with me marrying the man. Wow, twice and you married the man. Twice I married the man. And the problem becomes that the man you married is no longer the man you fell in love with. Right. In other words, somebody in that situation who's married with or without children but has built a life with someone else is a completely different character than that person divorced from all that and married to you. And that was a huge problem that the person I ended up married to 
didn't bear much resemblance to that person who I had fallen in love with. Hmm. And it was my own fault. I mean, I certainly chose it. I did whatever I could to make it happen. But people do change according to the environment they're in. So everybody says to you, or everybody said to me, it's a bad idea to sleep with married men. Your heart will get broken. But the reason why it actually was a bad idea was very different from what they were saying to me. Right. So why was it a bad idea? I mean, because as you said, it's the classic, and we just discussed a letter that, you know, like, oh, will he ever leave his wife? And you're saying, well, yeah, sometimes they actually do. And they did twice for you. I think often they do, actually. Yeah. But what was the downside for you? Well, you know, the downside for me is hard to talk about because I married these men and had children with them. And I love my children, and they were wonderful marriages in their own ways, as marriages are. And, you know, so I can't really say, well, I wish it hadn't happened, or I shouldn't have done that. It's it's really the story of my life. Uh, for whatever reason, I liked married men a lot, and I can tell you why. I, I found the role of being a mistress actually suited me perfectly. Huh. I, you know, I had my freedom. And I was somebody else's fantasy. Mm. And so I could have my own life and do whatever I wanted. And at the same time, you know, be with this person who was in love with me, of course. And here's my point again. The person he was in love with wasn't me. And the person I was in love with wasn't him. Right. right. In some ways, I felt uh, in both cases, these men had really interesting, important, and estimable wives. And I sometimes wondered if I wasn't in love with the wife, you know, not, I'm not gay, but the whole situation was so appealing to me that I wanted to, you know, it was almost like I wanted to be their child instead, Mm. but of course that wasn't available to me. So, and were the wives so fond of you? (laughs) <laughs> and many, many therapists have suggested that I was trying to take my father away from my mother. So that's not particularly astute. I mean, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. Don't know. Right. But what I found the problem was, was not that they didn't leave their wives. I think men are dying to leave their wives and women are dying to leave their husbands. Marriage is excruciatingly difficult in my experience. Yes, yeah. yes, it's we almost agree. impossible, right? I mean, it's just very hard to pull it off for more than, say, eight years, seven years. And, you know, it's very, very hard to stay with someone in a marriage. So really, as somebody who's coming in and hoping that either the husband or the wife will leave, in these cases, the husband, the odds are in your favor. So, Susan, we would love to get your perspective on a letter from somebody who has found herself involved with a married man. I'm going to read the letter now. Can you stay on the line with us? Sure. Dear Sugars, I'm a single mom in my early 40s. My teenage kids are the loves of my life. We have an amazing close relationship, and I couldn't be more proud. I'm the sole provider for our family, and so my life is quite busy. Five years ago, a friend, let's call him B, turned into an occasional lover. I was not naive about what we had. I'm seven years older than he is and from a very different cultural background. As much as we tried to not get too intertwined, it inevitably happened, and very quickly our relationship became emotionally charged. We spent a lot of time together. We also worked together. We had sleepovers, dinners, movies, endless lovemaking, but no prospect of a future together. About a year into our relationship, B broke it off with me to find a more age-appropriate, culturally acceptable, practical wife without baggage. As much as I knew this beautiful, intense affair would end, I had no idea how hard it would hit me. I won't go into the sappy details, but our breakup shook me to the core, and it took me a year to be able to breathe when I saw him in the hallways at work. Over the past three years, after much healing and a string of failed relationships, I've tried to date, and I've invested a lot of time in finding the right mate. I went on as many dates as my super busy life allowed. I wrote and answered hundreds of emails on online dating sites. I was always honest and straightforward with the men I met about seeking a meaningful relationship, not a short-lived hookup. Most of them, not all, completely lied. And after I had sex with them, they dumped me after a few weeks. So I swore off dating and went back to my drama-free single life. 
Last year, my former lover, B, got married. I felt genuinely happy for him and had no bad feelings about it. I did sadistically engage in peeking at his wedding pictures online. He looked happy, but I felt okay. Two months after he wed, he approached me at work and told me how much he misses me and the sex we had. This was the first time we'd spoken in over two years. Before I could say anything, he grabbed me and started kissing me with a passion I so well knew, but left in my past. When I could finally speak, I told him he was completely insane and to leave me alone. He cornered me like this a few more times over the next couple of months, and every time he touched and kissed me, I was on fire. I was completely hooked again. I managed to fight him off and again told him to leave me alone and go home to his wife. That's what bothered me the most. He's cheating on his wife. With me. Awful. What if I was the wife? How would I feel? I wanted no part of this. Six months later, he showed up at my door. The sex was incredible. Like unleashing a caged animal that's used to living free. We couldn't get enough of each other. It was indescribable. We never spoke. Not a word. Then he left. To my shock, I didn't feel any guilt, any pain. I felt mounds of joy. I felt happy, satisfied, fulfilled, complete. Soon after, our relationship became a regular affair. Every time I tried telling him enough was enough, he would show up and I wouldn't say no, so I stopped fighting it. I'd try to rationalize things and say to myself that I'm single, so it's not my problem, but his. But is it? With love, the paramour's dilemma. So what do you think of that, Susan? Yeah. Can she do this? Is this okay or...? What? Well, she can do whatever she wants, right? <laughs> right? I mean, it's a complicated letter. I mean, one of my questions that she brings up in the letter is, where are the kids? In other words, she's spending a huge amount of time with this guy, it sounds like. And let me tell you, children know everything, you know? And I just wonder about her children, who she says are the love of her life, in relation to what's happening to her. And I don't know. But, you know, in this life, we can do whatever we want. The question is, what's the you know, price? do we have a moral and ethical system that we want to adhere to? Right. If we do have a moral and ethical system that we want to adhere to, do we want that to have a relationship to the Western Christian system, which is so assumed and acceptable in the world that you and I live in? I mean, those are big questions, and she doesn't answer them. I'm not sure what I would advise her, because I'm somebody who would have answered that question one way in my 40s, as this woman is, and I would have said not that it's a victimless crime, but that we're all adults and people make their decisions, and that what these men were doing was what they were doing and what I was doing was what I was doing. And again, I would say it's complicated, but I wouldn't do that now. I feel different right now. So unfortunately for all of us, the Ten Commandments are not written in stone and passed down to us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these things shift and change according to situations and circumstances, and we all have to decide this stuff for ourselves. Right. You know, if she wants to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, well then she probably shouldn't be doing what she's doing. But if I were her, I would say to me, well, it's easy for you to embrace it now. But I'm in my 40s. I'm where you were in your 40s. And how did you behave in your 40s? Yeah. Well, she said initially when he comes to her, and I think his actions here are pretty manipulative, but he comes to her and starts, you know, kissing her passionately. And she's on fire, of course. It's straight out of Harlequin. But the moment that she can speak again, she's really morally troubled. That's what bothered me the most. He's cheating on his wife with me. Awful. What if I was the wife? How would I feel? I wanted no part of this. And then there's this curious moment in the letter where he shows up at her door and suddenly they're having sex again, as if she's right. just right. left right past her conscience and her, you know, the understandable reluctance that she would have to enter into a relationship that involves betrayal. She's party to betrayal and deceit. And yes, he's the central actor there, but she is also conscious of and unconscious of the fact that she's party to this thing as well. But later in the letter, she says something about his cheating is his problem. She's had a hard time out there, and she's somebody who, I mean, I identify with her. You know, she's figured out a way to support her children who she adores, 
And that's no easy thing. So she's driven and she's got a lot to do and every minute is spoken for. And here's the one thing that has been provided for her by the benevolent harmony of the universe, which actually takes the pressure off. So, you know, I can totally identify with that. What I think is going on for her, and I have been there, what she's saying is, I love the sex. This is a great setup for me right now. And yeah, there also is this part of me in the back of my mind. I'm also thinking, ah, is this wrong? Should I allow myself to enjoy this? Because I know, you know, I am in some ways breaking my ethical code because I do think it's a bad idea. It's awful. So she's of two minds. I mean, we see this in all the, almost all the letters that we got from the people who are the other woman. Yeah. They say something like, yes, I felt conflicted about it morally, but we love each other so much. And they always justify it. Like, oh, he's not in love with his wife. If they weren't ambivalent, they wouldn't write you a letter. Right. That's right. In other words, I was thinking about myself. I was not ambivalent. I thought it was fine, but I wouldn't have written you a letter. So, well, that's right. in other words, the, the, there's a self-selecting thing going on here where they write you the letter because they're ambivalent and confused. I think there are plenty of people and certainly plenty of men and certainly plenty of men of my acquaintance who think it's absolutely fine to sleep with someone who's married or to sleep with someone else if you're married. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is not a rare, we're not talking about murder here. Well, I want to make a clear distinction between like morally judging her and just why she might have trust issues. Remember the first time she got involved with this guy. You know, it was, again, earth-moving sex and wonderful. And then this happened. He breaks up with her, and she writes, as much as I knew this beautiful, intense affair would end, I had no idea how hard it would hit me. Our breakup shook me to the core, and it took me a year for me to be able to breathe when I saw him in the hallways. That happened. And history tends to repeat itself, especially when... (laughs) It directly involves with the same guy who broke your heart the first time. I just want to note that the reason that this guy broke it off with her before is to find somebody, quote, more age-appropriate, culturally acceptable, and a practical wife without baggage. And part of what I think is sort of swimming underneath the surface of this is she's not good enough to present in public. She's good for sex, hot, electrifying sex with no discussion or anything else. And there's something in that, even though it's intensely sexually gratifying, that feels also degrading. Well, I agree with you, but I wonder, and let me ask you guys a question. How much do we need to take people at their word? In other words, she's saying she knows this, she gets this. Um, but it's just too good to give up. It's just so great, but she knows it's going nowhere. She knows him. She knows if she gets emotionally involved with him, he'll dunk her. That's what he did before. But she's saying that's okay with her. And my inclination is to say, okay, you know, the problem that we're given is not, is he going to hurt her again? It's, is it okay for her to sleep with someone can she tell herself that Mm -hmm. the cheating is really his problem? Yeah, Yeah, I'm with you, Susan. Why don't you believe her, Steve? Why don't you believe her when she says that she understands that this is separate and just sex? Because she said last time, as much as I knew this intense affair... Last time was last time. He's going to do the same thing. She's not going to do the same thing. And that was years ago. That's what Sisyphus said. Last time was last time. This time the rock will get to the top of the hill. It's not going to come rolling down. That was last time. It was last time. People can't change? People absolutely can change, but I think there's an undercurrent of the fact that she's unsettled by this. And even though it's a great turn on and incredibly gratifying, she is involved with the same moral actor. And so it's a calculated risk. If it's just about her pleasure and gratification, it's a calculated risk. But I am not so quick to say that there isn't a moral burden to this because I think some of the trust issues, when somebody writes in a letter to us, I don't trust anyone, I take that seriously. Even if you're having great sex, the fact that you can't trust anybody and that you're uninterested in a relationship that might provide you both great sex and some emotional security, I take that as a sign that maybe the person is struggling to give themselves the right to have a relationship that includes both hot sex and not a burning house. Hot sex without the burning house. Isn't that the ideal? Before you got on the phone, Susan, you know, when I told that story about turning away from that affair I almost had, walking away from the burning building instead of into it, you know, part of it was to protect my own 
life. But part of it was that I felt like I was going to be doing something wrong to another woman. Mm -hmm. I was going to be sleeping with another woman's husband. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to bring pain and sorrow into somebody else's life if I can help it. Now, obviously, that's not the only thing that guides me. As you said, Steve, it's the code that we aspire to. Mm -hmm. Many of us fall short of that all the time. Well, but also many people don't aspire to that code. That's right. You're right. And they're fine. I mean, you know, we're not living in a particularly practicing Christian country. As I said, I certainly know many men who think it's fine to cheat on their wives and, uh, you know, don't want to hear that the golden rule says they shouldn't. Yeah. Right. But in this case, we're hearing from the the other woman, and it's true that at least a part of her is crying out. It's the reason she wrote to us. Right. It's part of the reason. One more question I have for you. So you said, you know, you were the other woman twice with married men who then went on to become your husbands. Yes. Have any of these men ever cheated on you? Did they have another woman? That happened to me once, or maybe twice. Did it change your perspective at all? And how did it feel? Yeah. It didn't. It should have changed my perspective. It felt (laughs) terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like being betrayed. And again, a therapist could tell you that the reason why I betrayed other people was to keep them from betraying me first, if you see what I'm saying. Now, that's therapy thought. But I don't think people do like being betrayed in general, do they? No, I've never met anyone who enjoyed it. (laughs) Here's the deal. (laughs) To, To this newlywed woman in this marriage, this is pretty bad. I'm going to go ahead and make the leap and say that that this would be like one of the worst things that's ever happened in her life. Yes. I'm going to guess she has no idea that her husband is doing this. And and yeah, it would be devastating to her. I could just write the letter to us, you know, myself, like as if it were from her. And (laughs) when she finds out. Or we could wait a few months and it will show up. Yes. So thank you so much for helping us not give the paramours dilemma an answer. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for complicating our answer in a lucrative way. Complicated. Yeah. It is complicated. <laughs> All right. Well, Susan, thank you so much. Yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. My talking pleasure. To you. We love talking to you. Take bye-bye. care. Okay, bye bye. You know, Cheryl, these letters are so specific, so powerful, so tangled, but I'm really thinking back to the story you told right at the beginning about that feeling of running into a burning house. And I, I want to sort of say that what we're really trying to grapple with is why people run into that burning house and what it feels like in there. And that's not limited to these two letters. The powerful undercurrent of the outpouring of letters that we received from other women and some other men was, I've been robbed of a sense of selfhood by this experience. I am defined by the situation as the other person who's ruining a marriage. But I'm actually a person. I'm in love. I'm finding deep gratification and meaning in this relationship. And I want to understand how I got into it, whether I should stay into it, how to get out of it, what it means morally. Indeed. And I want to say, when I go back to that moment when I decided not to run into the burning house, I certainly don't mean to imply that I was in any way morally superior to the version of myself who might have, at a different moment in my life, chosen to run right into that building. Right. And I think, you know, one thing that we have grappled with a lot over the course of this last hour is this idea of, like, is it right or wrong? And, you know, when we talked about infidelity, we had the same thing. You know, yes, it's not a good idea to lie to somebody you love. Yes, it's not a good idea to make a promise and 